You know, we've had 30 years of reasonably intense conflict. Uh, whole communities lived on their nerves, basically, uh, on the basis of adrenaline, or of mourning people that were shot, or, or looking over their shoulder or under their car to see if there was a bomb there. It takes a long time to actually readjust. If you can find certain common values that cross borders, then people can make sense of the fact that on an island, a small island, like the island of Ireland, you know, it is, it's not merely intelligent, it is absolutely necessary for people to live and work together. We're a group of students who were brought together by producer Kelly Kandel, and he basically got us together to go to Ireland, to shoot a film about the peace process there. The more research I did and learned about the the situation in Northern Ireland, the more interested I became. I'm really excited to be able to go over to Northern Ireland and to be able to dive into these two cultures, one being British and the other being Irish, and to really find out what this whole conflict is about. I'm trying to go in with, to this with an open mind, get both sides and catch both views and be open-minded about everything. I figured that going on this trip would definitely give me a better understanding of what's going on in the world today. Historians and academics have helped put things into a larger context, and in a lot of ways this conflict goes back centuries. So at the time when Ireland sought its independence from Britain, uh, the Protestant people obviously opposed that, so the settlement that the British government agreed to at that time was to draw a border in Ireland, uh, creating Northern Ireland and Northern Ireland remaining in Britain. The Unionist position which was comprised mainly of Protestants in Northern Ireland who wanted Northern Ireland to remain as part of the United Kingdom with Scotland, England and Wales. And then you had the uh, nationalist position which was comprised mainly of Catholics who wanted Northern Ireland to become part of a unified nation of Ireland. The British remain in jurisdiction in this part of the country. The island of Ireland is partitioned. British rule could only be maintained there by allowing the Unionist, almost an apartheid type uh, administration. People were treated unequally. That could only endure for a certain time. And the bubble burst in 1969 on the back of the civil rights struggle and the state's refusal to concede people what are very uh, basic entitlements. We had a history of empire which left two communities sitting side by side with very different experiences of government and power and a very different sense of where protection came and those were aligned with religion. And as the tide of, if you like, religion and politics went out elsewhere, they created different political communities with very different senses of where safety was. One saw Britain as a protector, the other saw Britain as an aggressor and an invader. Basically, there is a religious, historically a religious basis for the conflict. It is far too simple to talk about it as, as a division of that nature. It is political, it is economic, it is about uh, authority over land, it's about the way in which we interpret our history. The discrimination against Catholics in Northern Ireland uh, that people feel most deeply is the discrimination that happened under the Unionist government, which was set up uh, with the government of uh, uh, the Government of Ireland Act in, in uh, 1922, it was called a, a Protestant Parliament for a Protestant people. That's the discrimination that led to uh, the conflict uh, in that you know exploded. In, in 1969. Many people of my generation got caught up in an escalating spiral of violence. We had British troops on the streets, we had the escalating IRA violence. Many people got involved in politics, many people got involved in paramilitary organisations. Lots of people went to jail, lots of people died. It's just that all was being the same in this country. The IRA shot and bombed, they brought in the British Army. And when the British Army tried to retaliate, sure, the, the IRA, they were on the, te the TV crying and campaigning about their human rights, but it's okay for them to shoot and maim. But once they start getting hit back, they don't like it. And a lot, of, a lot of Catholics actually totally disagreed with the military campaign of the IRA. But whatever about that, they would have said the conflict happened because of 
previous discrimination against Catholics, because of the inequity in society, um, and because um, of the historical legacy of the, the Irish situation. And they would have seen it as a war. On the Protestant side, there was, and I generalise, there was more of a tendency to see it as an aggravated crime wave. That these people were not militants or however you want to describe them, they were criminals. British troops were brought in, in effect, to protect, ironically, to protect Irish nationalists against British unionists uh, because the, the Irish nationalists had no confidence in the police force. And the police force, has to be said, had very little sympathy with Irish Catholics. I think it's true to say that the, that the most ordinary working class people, whether employed or unemployed, who would have borne the brunt of the violence, whether it was violence from the state or whether it was sectarian violence from one side or the other. A lot of what happened here in the late 60s was modelled on Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement in the US in the early 60s. This is not a simple civil rights situation as, it's outrageous of me to say, a simple civil rights situation as in the United States. The issue in Northern Ireland is more complicated because yes, that was the issue, but there is another issue as well, which is uh, and the issue of the survival of the state and its possible absorption in another state. So right from the start, the civil rights move issue does not exist as simply as an issue of internal reform. In the shadow of empires, groups grow up uh, who have different relationships to the power of the empire. And that it's the nature of empires to mix those people together. So for the people who relied on the empire, they're now very nervous that they're left exposed. And for the people who were, if you like, uh, invaded, their feeling is the invasion hasn't gone away because we're still part of this uh, territory. And so how do you negotiate those different experiences of power in the same place? You're talking about London or the British state. They had a political problem. It's very difficult to get out because it's very difficult for any state to expel a million citizens who want to remain part of the state. In fact, it's so difficult that nobody has actually done this in the history of the 20th century. So one of the morals of this is that ethnic conflicts happen not because people in Kisweather are conflict of bad people compared with elsewhere, but that they happen in an environment where um, uncertainties are such that, uh, and insecurities are such, that the appeal of those who have weapons uh, becomes much stronger. The Irish obsession with history, whether it's Irish nationalists or Ulster Unionists, uh, is a perfectly normal one for people in their circumstances. That's to say, for people who feel their identity under pressure. And that is what people everywhere do. They turn to history for, to some extent, ammunition, uh, for spiritual sustenance when they feel their identity under pressure. I got the tales of the real people. Um, not the politicians. Um, I got a lot of conflicting views on the Falls Road, which I really liked. It's basically about land. Who owns this island? That's basically what it's about. It's not a religious conflict. It's still basically a British-Irish conflict. They tell you God's honest truth. Yeah. To me, it was all about religion. It's all about religion. It was all about religion. When you talk to other people, they, they don't even know anymore, and I think that makes it so much worse because now they grow up, they don't even need a reason anymore, and how do you fix that? If any of us now were to try and uh, unpick the facts of history, we'd end up with a bigger row than we already have. And um, When you ask the question about the facts of the situation, I'm not sure that there are any, given that it's always someone else's fault and it's always someone else's responsibility. If, if you take those two perspectives from the Republican side and the, and the, and the Unionist side, those histories will be written in very different ways. So that, that's the next area that we're going to have to discuss. Well, the Good Friday Agreement is both a peace settlement uh, and a political settlement. Never have I felt a sense of gratification and responsibility and gratitude that I feel today. The uh, agreement was an historic step forward. Uh, but I said on the day that I announced the agreement that by itself the agreement would not provide or guarantee peace, uh, stability, or reconciliation. It created 
a possibility, a context for those desirable goals to be achieved, but there would be many difficult steps ahead, and indeed there have been. There were various false starts, various efforts that went nowhere, and it so happened that uh, we had Bill Clinton in place, we had John Hume, we had for the Irish government Albert Reynolds as a Taoiseach, and then we had Tony Blair. It just seemed to me obvious that we couldn't, as it were, win militarily. The IRA were never going to win by bombing the British out of Northern Ireland. And I just felt the time was, was right to take advantage of the fact that there was a kind of stalemate um, to say, let's, let's put the politics into this situation. When I came into office, we had uh, uh, pictures uh, going out on television of funerals every day, and young people and old people and everybody. I felt that if I could bring peace to Ireland in the first instance, it would change the image of Ireland out going around the world. You could not have had the Good Friday Agreement without American initiative, without the role of President Clinton himself, without the role of Senator George Mitchell. I think that President Clinton's cynical intervention in Northern Ireland, um, and that's what it was, because it was really to placate an Irish-American lobby in America, um, had vast repercussions um, and probably uh, played an important role in the corrupting of politics here in Northern Ireland. He turned terrorists into statesmen. It was at the talks leading to the Good Friday Agreement, myself and my party have proposed that the last word should be with the people and not the politicians. And so the agreement was put in a joint referendum north and south and was overwhelmingly voted by the people north and south. Yes. 71.12%. Now that wipes out the extremists completely because paramilitaries can no longer claim as they always did that they were acting in the name of the people. Bill Clinton was the first president to put Northern Ireland and its resolution right at the top of his agenda. And uh, he, he was a great supporter of our peace process. And of course, he was the first president of the United States ever to come and visit our streets. I pledge you America's support. We will stand with you as you take risks for peace. The main structures of the Good Friday Agreement encompassed uh, power sharing arrangements between Catholics and Protestants, or indeed nationalists and unionists, which means that no major decision could be reached without cross-community support or the support of the majority of the Parliament. When the Good Friday Agreement arrived along, for the Protestant community, they suddenly were faced with the British government negotiating with people that they had consistently described as criminals. And it meant that they had to do a, a complete mental flip in terms of saying, why are these people in government? Why should someone who we see as a criminal be a minister for education? Which is what happened with Martin McGuinness. Martin McGuinness in the early years was a leader of the IRA, and he moved on to become the Sinn Féin education minister for Northern Ireland. Well, this outraged loyalists and unionists for obvious reasons. Uh, <laughs> I don't like Republicans because of, they've murdered my people, they've, they've tried to steal my country from me, that's the way I look at it. I met Martin McGuinness at the inauguration of the President of Ireland, and uh, obviously we didn't say too much to each other. I would probably have tried to kill him. Friends of mine did try to kill him, but again, he has, uh, if he was a footballer, playing against me in a football match, I'd wish he was playing for our team. We see the Good Friday Agreement as having corrupted large parts of the political life, social life and economic life of Northern Ireland. Ask people in this community what difference the signing of the Good Friday Agreement made to them and they would say absolutely none whatsoever because none of the benefits of it came back to us. It has made a great change in people's lives here, a great change. You don't see British Army about these streets anymore. Well, it might be superficial, they're still here in the background, but 
generally speaking, has made a great change in people's lives. Sure has. Quite a lot of people from this community voted no. In other words, they they didn't agree with with some of the clauses within the Good Friday Agreement, and that happens for that that happened for a number of reasons. But I think mainly. Um, Protestants feel that they, they've became the underclass within Northern Irish society and that the whole uh, the whole British rule which, which used to be which used to be part and parcel of everything that happened here is being slowly but surely taken away from us. As the population of the Shankill Road is reducing, which a little bit explains the sort of sense of loss and inferiority that the Protestant community has, you know, because its population is getting smaller. It feels like it's losing in Belfast. The population of Belfast used to be predominantly Protestant, it's now almost 50-50. Well, the working class people are going to benefit from the peace accord, no matter what. Everyone is going to benefit from it. You know, from the working class right up to the to the uh, upper class. You know? But I mean, these and people's, as I say, quality of life has improved, and there's a different environment now in some of these areas than there was before. You cannot go back to majoritarianism in a situation where there is such a crucial structural disagreement about the governance of society. It has to be mediated power sharing with uh, representation from uh, the, per the perceived minority as well as the perceived majority. You're asking people who have suffered at each other's hands suddenly to say, not only we'll trust you, but we want you in our government. We want you running our schools. We want you running our hospitals. Uh, and I... <laughs> I suppose, I mean, I said yes to the Good Friday Agreement and if I was asked to make a decision now, I would still say yes to it because I think people have to take risks and I can understand how at that stage the paramilitaries needed to be offered something to encourage them to buy into it. Yeah, the challenge for the political leaders of Northern Ireland is to pursue with determination the objective of gaining full implementation of the agreement. Hundreds and hundreds of people are alive today thanks to the Good Friday Agreement. It might not be a perfect agreement, but it's a good place to start. We can see that everywhere throughout the world, where injustice reigns. We see it in the Middle East. We see it in Sri Lanka. We see it in different other situations where people feel they have no other recourse but to stand up and fight for their rights. I was one of those who did stand up and fight. The DUP does not express these views out of fear. We have lived through nearly 40 years of sheer hell on earth when the IRA targeted us for murder and we have stuck to our principles. What about the people in the short strand who are continuously okay. under attack from loyalist people who attack the short strand every okay. weekend no, because no. it's a Catholic enclave? What about them? What's the DUP? Okay. Where's, where's Robinson and all them? Comrades, that there? Comrades, you'll have your... Why are they not coming there and Still protecting much. the people? Okay. And they're sitting there giving us all that. Comrade, Why are they not protecting Comrade, the short strand? Comrades, Comrade, will you sit down? There'll be an opportunity for question and answers. You know, a lot of the people around here don't have Catholic friends because they've never worked in a mixed workforce and they've always stayed within their own area. It doesn't make them bad people or make them, um, you know, bigots. It's just, it's just the way it happened, you know? Well, I think after conflict, people want conflict to finish, but they don't necessarily want to mix with their enemy. And so there's a strong tendency to say, let's keep our own areas, let's have apartheid, let's live separately. The difficulty with the notion of apartheid is that, in fact, it's not stable. We'd certainly go to separate schools, we'd sign on at separate welfare exchanges, and to add insult to injury, we'd be buried in separate graveyards. And to put that in context, you've got to remember that we're about 90 miles long by 90 miles wide. We're a tiny society, there are no international date lines running through Northern Ireland. And yet we have the manifestation of borders all over our, our, our countryside and, and all through our cities. We call them peace lines or peace walls, and we're massively separated and divided. Our approach is totally opposed to violence from any source because, as I keep pointing out, it's people that have rights, not territory. Without people, any piece of earth, even Ireland, is only a jungle. And when people are divided, violence has no role to play in solving the problem. It only deepens the division and makes the problem 
more difficult to resolve. I'm from South Central Los Angeles, which has had its own fair share of conflict. And I'd never been out of the country before. And here I am in Northern Ireland, and one of the first people that I interview is Jerry Adams, president of Sinn Féin, the political wing of the Irish Republican Army. What made you feel that military action was the only thing that the British government would listen to or would help your cause? Because it was. They didn't listen. We, we marched and were beaten off the streets. We were gassed, we were water cannoned, we were battened, people were killed. The demands were small. The right to vote, the right to an end to repressive legislation. Uh, and given the tradition in Ireland and the unresolved national question, it wasn't long before young men and women then took up arms. We always took the view, you don't buy terrorists off. You've got to defeat them. If you're going to have any kind of moral basis for society, then you've got to do that. But we were labelled extreme because that was the position we took. The thing about it is, of course, the vast majority of people in Northern Ireland are extremists. You know, nobody's going to bomb me or shoot me or, or cajole me into United Ireland. It just won't happen. You know, I have friends in the South who, who do want to see someday a United Ireland. They're nationalists and they have the right for that aspiration. But nobody's going to force it down my throat. We would resist it. For so long, each side has felt like they have no option. Politicians, no matter what the system of government, uh, are often constrained by the views of those they represent. In situations where you have identity conflict, you have, diff you have conflict of the very le legitimacy of the state, then one side's gain is by definition another side's loss. If you try to go some step toward understanding the other fellow, then there will be somebody on your own side who will shout louder that you'll be trained the community. And as a result of those two clashing and conflicting forces, marginal identities and voices and experiences have been written out. Uh, class politics is something which has been marginalised in the political sphere. Uh, women's identity, women's issues um, uh, have also been marginalised, as have the, the rights and, and the experiences of, of ethnic minorities um, and, and, and people from, from the gay community. So these are all issues which in any other kind of modern Western uh, civic society are issues which are as important as anything else. They have all been uh, brushed aside. People will respond to the political conditions in which they live. So if you've got bad political conditions and people have bad experiences, you couldn't expect them to be reconciled. I mean, I wouldn't expect you to be reconciled to a system or a society which didn't value you. Why would you? The philosophical underpinning of the Good Friday Agreement was to say, look, we need to find a way in which those who want a united Ireland, those who want Northern Ireland to remain part of the UK, can argue their case. Um, a political framework within which that debate can be um, taken forward and possibly even resolved, but at the same time doing so on the basis of very common values to do with justice, to do with equality, to do with e equal status and treatment for people. And all conflict is about difference, whether it's race, religion or nationality. And difference is an accident of birth. Nobody chose to be born in it. Therefore, it should be fully respected. People would ask me, is there any atheist here? You know, there is, but they're Protestant ones or Catholic ones, you know? <laughs> you're not allowed to sit in the fence, you're either one or the other. So what you're left with is, is mechanisms through which the political communities of nationalism and unionism can work with each other, but you're not left with any mechanisms of which the communities can start to integrate. In other words, you've got no mechanisms which bring down those interface walls in Belfast and start mixing community and in that you're leaving yourself the possibility of, of conflict in the future. And then one of the first things we found out was that more walls have gone up to separate communities since the peace process. They're at, instead of walls coming down they've had to build more and that somehow although these people have agreed not to kill each other they haven't found a way to live together yet and they can't they can stop the guns but they don't know how to create peace.
we had a chance to go right into the interface areas, which are areas where Catholics and Protestants are basically living right next door to each other. Um, one side of the street may be all Catholic, the other side may be all Protestant. And so, as you can imagine, these are areas with a lot of conflict. And this area we're going into now, the Lower Falls, became a no-go area. And the Republican movement, the IRA, grew in strength. And rather than looking for rights in Northern Ireland as such, they, they wanted to kick the state out. They wanted to overthrow the British state. Therefore, any police or army coming into this area would have been seen as legitimate targets. In fact, any police or army anywhere in Northern Ireland was seen as legitimate targets. This is the peace line that we're at now. This is the wall that actually separates Protestants from Catholics. Now, this wall was built about 25 years ago and it was built to stop the trouble in this particular area. Before the wall was built, Protestants and Catholics were like living together around here. Well, not so much together, but beside each other. And when all the trouble kicked off in this, the late 60s and early 70s, there was a lot of intimidation here. And the government found that the only way really to stop the trouble was by building this wall. And it was wanted by the people. So it will come down whenever the people decide. And I would say it's a long way off. I don't really like being doom and gloom, but I'm only telling you the way it is. A spade's a spade. This would be sort of a barrier. People would be afraid to walk down this direction past the markets, even to go into the centre town or to somewhere else. They will go another route. They, they, they just have that, a fear that people will recognise them, particularly young people, particularly young men. Those houses there were attacked just three weeks ago. The lady in the same house had her door kicked in and crowd went in and ripped her telephone wires out of the wall. Some of the pensioners had their windows broken. So if you've seen down in the heart of the estate, it is lovely and people, you know, are really proud of their homes. It is still very difficult to live around the edges of the community because those are the houses that get attacked. From the, from the end of these red brick houses, just past the trees, that's a continuation of Nationalist Alliance Avenue. And here we'll have Protestant Glenbrin. The houses in the Nationalist uh, say they would have suffered pipe bomb attack, there would have been a nail bomb attack, there would have been uh, numerous occasions when they had automatic machine gun fire into the houses, a lot of people had to move. Yes, I think it is accepted by both communities that the Loyalist Parliamentaries controlled this end of Ardoin, whilst Provisional IRA controlled Republican Ardoin. Accepted by both as a form of uh, community policing. If there was an attack on your community, well then you would immediately expect a response from the paramilitaries from within your community to avenge the attack that took place. And that's how it went on for, for years and years and years. You can see behind me, you can see the boundary wall. Uh, it's a security wall. Sometimes you can, you can hear them called the peace wall. Uh, media have often portrayed them as peace walls. You know, for nationalists, they're not. I mean, they're points of contention. They breed uh, hostility, they breed ignorance, they breed fear. Stones and missiles can still be thrown over them. They're not going to stop bullets. Basically what they're there for is to keep people apart. The snow screens would be prevalent along the, the rear of all these houses down. Um, maybe for, you know, I mean, as far as the egg and pan. As to why it was needed. And basically at the end of the day it was a case of good fences make good neighbours. And it gives security to both sexes of the community. Who at that time were feeling very vulnerable because both sides were being attacked. Patrol bombs, pipe bombs, bricks, everything, you name it. If there's an anticipation that there's going to be trouble, uh, they would contact each other on the mobile phone network uh, you know, to warn each other that you know, there's a crowd gathering within our area. We suspect that they're going to move over towards your interface or whatever. What we do with the mobile phone network is, is if there are sp uh, sporadic instances, uh, someone on that side of the community will obviously have my contact number. Uh, it's as simple as them just giving me a call on the mobile phone. Community activists and other residents can come up and we can, comb we can combat any kind of uh, recreational violence, we can combat anything that becomes of a more serious nature. We have now moved away from a conflict situation. The meetings are no longer about conflict, they are about uh, joint training programmes together. The mobile phone is still there, but it has moved beyond the mobile phone system now. It's personal, people are accountable, and it's working. I don't think people are ready to let go of the past and what's happened. And until that happens, I think there'll be conflict for quite a while. I've seen a lot of people that care about 
who they are and where they are and what they're willing to do for their, their points of view. On the same hand, I've seen a lot of people not be able to take good news in this country. Today I was at Cori Mila and conducted some interviews, which was really interesting. It's a place where they bring Catholics and Protestants together um, in kind of a non-denominational sort of worship kind of thing, and they kind of hang out and just have dialogue, and it was, it was a really neat experience. It's primarily a safe place for people to be, of all, you know, regardless of your background and where you're coming from. What we're going to do now is look a wee bit at identity and religion um, and how what religion you belong to might affect your identity. And what we're going to do, it's very, very simple. I'm not going to teach you anything. I'm not here to teach. You're not at school. It's about you all together sharing a bit about your experiences. I think I met Raymond. Um, as far back as 1977, we came here as, as, as young people. It was escapism to get up to Corimila. Um, it was getting you away from your peer group who you were involved with. It was getting you away from being become involved in paramilitary organisations. It was keeping you out of prison. There's people like myself and John and other people. We went on to do diplomas. We went to university and we've done master's courses and we're trying to pass that on to young, young people we would now work with within our own communities. As you approach the town, you notice that the carved stones are painted green, white and orange. And many houses have tricolours hanging outside. How does this make you feel? Do you hesitate or walk on into the town? I suppose for me, I learned to welcome differences, to try and understand differences and celebrate those differences that people had a right to have a different opinion. It wasn't the end of the world. Um, to understand the historical context for what Protestants were saying. So for 300 years, you know, they, they have had, you know, their place here. So they have their right to celebrate. And sometimes what they take doesn't come out for two or three years. Um, and it's sort of a seed, it's, it's like a seed, isn't it? It's, you, you sow the seed and after that seed, then grow something, maybe five, ten years' time. I suppose Cardamila has a motto, um, that Cardamila begins when you leave. You can rebuild structures, you can put buildings back up, uh, replace burned out cars, uh, repave roads, but to change what's in people's hearts and minds is the hardest thing of all. And somebody came along, and, and put a gun on their hand. And all of a sudden, they became somebody. The problem now is they're going to take the gun back off those young fellas. And they're going to go back on the street corner and they're going to be nothing. We have to create some sort of new environment for those people where they don't need a gun to have a, a, a place in the community. We've all let them down there. They are a product of the troubles. We have to find some way of giving them a future. What we find is there's a huge amount of academic stuff written about peace building and conflict resolution. There's very little of it, of it that's applicable to the groups we're working on the ground. What, we, what we're trying to do is to, sort of, to, to, to have material to say, if a paramilitary flag goes up outside your community centre tomorrow morning, what do you do? There are a number, a very, very small number of mixed communities in, in Belfast, of which the largest uh, is probably an area known as Balanafai. Our organisation was set up in 1974 by a group of concerned Catholic and Protestant residents who came together because they were very concerned at that particular time and during the history of the Troubles, communities were polarising and many communities were splitting into their traditional religious uh, denominations. I've been working um, in cross-community projects with children up and down the road from Protestant and Catholic churches doing things like um, getting to know you sessions and weekend residentials to build the bonds that will hopefully make the conflict a, a bit easier to come out of. We encourage the development of mixed residence groups and that's a lot of my work. So you'll have naturally forming residence groups of Catholics and Protestants coming together around issues that concern them. Young people are socialised into inter-community violence at their interfaces. Whenever we hit July and marching season, um, 
kids will start spending more time with people that live in a different area. Um, and then we'll, we'll start to feel a bit alienated from the people that live in their own area. For example, um, the Catholic kids that I work with um, will travel down to the lower Omoa Road where there are more Catholics. Um, and the Protestant children will start spending more time with the Protestant men in the, in, the, in the area to do things like the parades and things like that. Women become the people who can, who almost literally carry their community you know, across an interface. This is what our community is like. And in that way, women have played a tremendous role um, over the years. It is the women that are going, we want to get together again like we used to, look after our kids, do our normal days, work and everything else, and they want the wall down. With the wall there, it also brings fear. What's on the other side, I don't know, okay? With the wall down, you're seeing who's there. You're able to talk and communicate. You know, if the people at the other side of the wall are my brothers and sisters, I want to go to know them. Uh, for years here, we have been going from Clonard on a Sunday uh, to be with different uh, congregations of the church on the Shankill side of the wall and other places as well to the Church of Ireland people, Presbyterian people, Methodist people, just being with them on a Sunday in a spirit of faith and friendship. The hate is still there. The walls are still up. Uh, and they're constant reminders of how things used to be. They can't get bullets through the walls, but it makes you think if they could, you know, would they? Everybody can resolve some type of conflict, and why can't these people but you know what, maybe you can't, you know? Maybe just one side's gonna be one way and the other side's gonna be another way. We're always gonna see a different point of view, but it's how we tackle things mm -hmm. is more important. Uh, the way we'd have tackled things before, shoot them or stone them or, you know, but now we're prepared to sit around a table and discuss things. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a major breakthrough. The vast majority of young people here go to either Catholic schools or Protestant schools. Don't necessarily meet unless they go to university. Many of them don't go to university. Many of them live in very segregated areas. So how do we get out of a ghetto mentality? In those sort of situations, building up a stereotype of the other is easy. For me, it's, a, it's at the heart of the problem. I would, I would be, uh, I mean, I would create integrated schooling. <laughs> We have 57 integrated schools in Northern Ireland um, with another three to four in development uh, at present, um, which really means we have 5% of the school going population in integrated schools. They are basically trying to put together schools to integrate both Protestant and Catholic communities and so that the children can come together and learn from each other. We come from two different religions, my husband and myself, and uh, we decided that we would like something very neutral for our son. Um, I'm sure you know the history in Northern Ireland. Um, so we decided to choose something that was as neutral a background for him as possible to give him the best possible start in life. Mum and Dad are both Catholic, so, but um, my granny was Catholic too, but my granddad um, is half Catholic, sort of half Protestant. So he wanted me to go to a mixed school. Religion doesn't matter that if you're Protestant or you're Catholic or anything else, you can still make friends. Basically all of my friends are Protestants, but I just set that aside and carry on seeing them, like their personality, how nice they are, instead of saying, no, I don't like you, you're Protestant. The girls are now playing with children from African origin and Asian origins and find that quite normal, you know. And traditionally Northern Ireland hasn't been that racially mixed and that's a very good thing for my children in my view to be exposed to that. Again, I have to use the expression the shared space because shared space is so um, hard to find in, in Northern Ireland. So there is evidence that integrated education does make a difference to the young people. We regard our schools as something very precious to us, the Catholic schools, because they were put there at considerable expense and sacrifice at a time when there were not schools available. The imperative to achieve a reconciled society is still with us. But we think that it won't be achieved necessarily by the, uh, you know, having less religion in schools than at present. So I think it's quite exciting that it kind of creates a small community, like a microcosm really of what society could be like if we didn't have so many boundaries and labels. These young people have parents, siblings, grandparents and a wider community. So 
think we're part of the reconciliation process, but a small part. I believe the schooling and I believe the par parenting is the only way to help with kids. I mean, my wee laddie's in third year, which makes him 14. He didn't even know what a Catholic was. And that, I mean, that's hard to believe. He didn't know what a Catholic was. Very often what, what's required is people want the space to tell their story. Because one of the things that they find most alienating is when we talk in statistics. 30,000 people injured in bombs or whatever, you know. Um, and they say, but what about my father? And what they want is to humanise their experience. What I've seen is my version of the truth. Somebody else stand beside me and see something different, you know. So, I mean, what I've seen. And you know, the only way you can actually learn is to listen to other stories, you know. Mm -hmm. As long as you're prepared to listen to what other people say yeah. and accept it, that's, yeah. that's, that's fair enough. Reconciliation after conflict requires that you make a relationship with someone who has persecuted you, which is based on, in the end, if not trust, at least a willingness to walk with them. And that is, in a sense, a miracle. You can't force people to live in shared conditions, situations where those people have a long history of distrust and conflict. We have to deal with the underlying distrust and conflict and we have to help people then to recognise that basically they have to share this society. I can only tell you that I long ago realised that hatred is a waste of emotion. The only person that really affects is yourself. The person at the other end uh, the target or the cause of the hatred might not even be conscious that you're traumatized or stressed out or obsessed by it, even if you may have good cause, even if you've been very badly hurt. There's an old saying, let he who seeks revenge dig two graves, because you're digging your own grave as well. I mean, it's not my grave I'd be digging. It'd be my grandson's or my granddaughter's grave. And you can only have peace in Northern Ireland if neither side can claim victory. As long as people aren't being killed, as long as the guns aren't being used in a, in a major way, then that is colossal progress. And my own quality of life, the quality of life of my neighbours, my neighbourhoods, and all of that, we all do feel very much a part of the peace process. Some that has come about in our lifetime, um, hopefully this will be the last time we'll need a, post, a peace process. And in your opinion, how do societies like Northern Ireland change? Slowly. <laughs> Mostly. Well, there had been some talk about the fact that the IRA may make some sort of a statement about their future intentions, and we just happened to be there, fortunately, when they made their final statement of their decommissioning of weapons. We are at a point where you know, just as you're here, we're, we're waiting for big responses from the IRA. My name is Shannon Walsh. I'm a Republican ex-prisoner, and I've been asked by the leadership of Ogley and Ahern to read the following statement. The leadership of Ogley and Ahern has formally ordered an end to the armed campaign. This will take effect from 4 p.m. this afternoon. All IRA units have been ordered to dump arms. Well, I broadly welcome the IRA statement that basically arms are being dumped, units are being stood down, because that to me represents uh, the beginning of the end of the IRA's military capacity. Even where people in a qualified way welcome the statement, uh, they will wait to see what does it mean in practice. We won't want to hear words, we'll want to see, to see actions. No more weapons, no more guns, no more bombs. We're going to be together as a community, as a whole, and there is going to be peace. We need a cut-off point here. We need somewhere to stop everything and to move on. We'll have to somehow convince the victims and the injured people that this is the only way. We'll have to convince the people in the paramilitaries those days are gone. We go into this next phase of our struggle armed only by whatever mandate we receive armed only with our political ideas and armed only with our vision of the future. Adams and McGuinness were central to any change. These were clearly people who came out of struggle. They were people who actually came out of working class areas. They had the confidence of the membership uh, of the Republican movement. And only people with a history involved in the struggle for 30 years could have brought the movement from violence to a peaceful way forward. 
The IRA have gone out of business. Mm -hmm. They've ended their war. Uh, where the marching season this time, for the first time in nearly 40 years, there was not a British soldier on the streets to support the police. And that is an extraordinary transformation. There's more jobs in Northern Ireland than ever before. There are more people coming to visit Northern Ireland as tourists and visitors than there are people living there. The IRA decommissioning was probably the most exciting thing for me on the entire trip because it was making steps forward. You know, they were putting down their weapons and saying, you know, we're ready to talk peacefully. It takes as long a time, as much resources, and as much energy and imagination to build peace as it did to wage war. And for us, the war was 30 years. The process of coming to terms with the fact that we weren't the good guys is almost the hard spiritual process of, of Northern Ireland. And I think that in the end, it's going to have to be faced. My experience is it was a very different society 10 years ago to what it was. It's vastly improved. We couldn't have stood here doing this 10 years ago. Basically, it wouldn't, just wouldn't have happened. Uh, we couldn't have had these conversations 10 years ago, so it has changed. The new generation doesn't care. The older generation is holding on, but the new generation just is sick of like, pain, is sick of bombs, is sick of their friends being killed, is sick of their family to being torn to pieces. You know, we just want to live as one. A lot of parties and, and individuals need to realise that you can't make peace with your friends, you have to make peace with your enemies. It appears that they are working um, very closely together as First Minister and Deputy First Minister, it's something which people would not have uh, considered possible. And once we start working together, then the real border in Ireland will be eroded. Because the real border is not a line in a map, it's in the minds and hearts of people. I think about the only lesson that can be learned is that there has to be a willingness to talk to the other side. There has to be willingness to talk. You can't have solutions without talking. And therefore, people who stand on their dignity or stand on their rights and say, we will not talk with them because they are such deplorable people, there is no solution in sight. You have to talk. The one thing that is absolutely clear about processes like this is that unless moderate people feel there is some avenue for them to, to go down in terms of a, of, of a, of a road leading to a a final outcome, a peaceful outcome. If the moderates don't have that avenue to go down, then what happens is the, 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 the initiative is just taken by the extremes. And that's what you've got to avoid the whole time. People can agree, but they need a framework constantly managed within which to articulate their differences and find agreement. We are now teaching people that there are far more important things that unite them than that divide them. And that at the basis for that, from a Christian point of view, there is the teaching of the gospel narratives in terms of uh, the gifts of cooperation, love, understanding, and of course reconciliation. The importance of taking those risks while the, while the violence is still going on. We have a huge number of phil philanthropic organizations who will pile into an area once peace has been achieved. But actually you build your credibility by being there when people are in crisis and when there, there is violence. In order to persuade people who may feel in their own integrity that they're not going to put up with uh, the type of inequality, that they are going to respond in an armed way, it's up to everyone else to prove that, that they don't have to do that, that there's another way forward. Generally speaking, uh, it isn't one more sermon from a pulpit that is required uh, to get armed groups to stop. Uh, they have to be persuaded that it is in their own interest to do so. And it is very difficult to do that preaching, preaching from a distance. There has to be uh, some kind of economic growth and opportunity uh, for people to be able to prosper in their lives in a way that doesn't make them easy prey for, for those who uh, committed to and employ violence. It's not perfect, but it has allowed us that breathing space to take a step back from murdering, targeting, from bombing. You know, and there's a lot of people alive today because of the Good Friday Agreement, so we've got a lot to be thankful for. I don't really think any of us realized what we were getting ourselves into over here. Come see this country. Come see what these people have been through. Uh, Every inch is more beautiful than the last. This is the first time in my life, and I'm going to be 44 this year, 
that I have known that I can walk down my own road without being shot, without a bomb going off. Um, do you see a complete end to the violence anytime soon? Uh, hopefully, yes, because it just can't go on forever, you know. I, I think as the generations grow, it make it better, you know. But wouldn't it be wonderful if the conflict was played out on, on the arena that is a, uh, a parliamentary body, rather than having our human bodies lying on pavements? It appears to me that both sides are really trying to uh, come to um, an understanding and a consensus. And it, to be completely honest, I think that Americans have a lot to learn. <laughs> I think we have a lot to learn um, from people over here.